Right now, um, I want to get to my message, but let me put this before the message. We need to, last week I preached on um, the parable of the four soils, right? We talked about building our house in a rock, not on sand. And um, if you were here last week, we talked about how Israel was waiting to retaliate for what Iran had done, and that happened on Thursday. That happened on Thursday. So what we got to understand now is what has never happened before is Israel, Iran has never attacked from their own soil at Israel, from their soil to Israel. They've always used proxies, Houthis, Hezbollah, Hamas, and now this is the first time. So Israel did retaliate, um, and I expected something stronger, but they did. Here's what we need to do. We need to pray for a de-escalation of what's going on in the region, not just in that region, but even what's going on over here. So we have to be a wise, totally wise, totally awake, totally aware, but not fearful, because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen? Amen. So let's pray right before we start. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We want to thank you for your presence and your power that is here today. God, we thank you, Lord, that you are in the room. You are in our, you are in our homes right now. You are working. You are orchestrating. And we submit our time and our, our moments to you right now. Father, help me to preach. Help us to lean in and to listen. We want to give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise for what you're doing. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Come on. Thank you one more time, everybody. He is worthy of our praise amen before you have a seat give somebody a high five fist bump elbow chicken wing hug something to somebody around you and i want to say well done for coming to church today well done turn to the person to, uh, turn to the person next to you tell them good job good job tell your spouse good job getting ready on time good job good job you know it's 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 easier it's so much easier to stay home and watch online and if you're home watching online i love you but it's harder to bring your kids and your family to church because there's a battle there's a battle waking up comfort is a battle um football season is a battle that's why dallas just come church already dallas fans it's over just why 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 go through it dallas it's a battle to get the kids, to have breakfast, to come to church. It's, it's all a battle. But when you get here, come on, the battle is won by the Lord. Can I get an amen? You are here today. So that's why, that's why I say good job. That's why I say well done. I, I, and and, and I, if I was, like when I was a, in church, and if the pastor said, thank you for coming, like for what? This is not a hotel. This ain't a, ho this ain't a restaurant. Thank you for coming. This is the house of God. And I expected to get me and my family to church every single Sunday as much as possible, unless I had to work. So well done, everybody. Good job. Good job. Give yourselves a hand. And thank you for coming. I am grateful. But good job. You did it for you. You didn't do it for us. Amen? And now more than ever before, we got to build our lives on the rock. And I want to thank the worship team. Can we let them go, everybody? Thank you. By the way, good, good job, Nacho. Nacho Libre, if you're wondering, what was that that wrestler that's nacho libre uh one of my f f at one point it was a favorite movie of mine i also want to say um happy anniversary 50th anniversary to dennis and michelle wilborn 50 years everybody stand up stand up <clears throat> yes good job man and they're going to be in marriage conversation and they're going to be on one of the panels on how do you keep the spice in that marriage going and um, I'm excited to have them there. So, so grateful to be with you. I want you to open your Bibles to Judges chapter 6. Welcome everybody online and in, in different rooms here today. Judges chapter 6. And we are going to go through, uh, continue our series called Built Different. Built Different. I love that. I love it. Built Different. We're like, oh, oh he built different. You know, you hear that about athletes. He, he built different. And he's built different because we build different. We, we're building different. We're building from what the world is building. The, building, the world is building differently, right? If, if, my friends and my family that don't follow Jesus Christ, they're building on different materials. They're building on reputation. They're building on experience. They're building on what the culture says. They're building on what we're, they're expected to do. They're building, and it's the way that I was building. And when I realized when the waves come and they crash and they hit, that house will not stand. And so what we have to build is we have to build on the rock rather than on sand. We can't build on sand. We need to build on rock. Everybody say rock. 
Now, the other thing we don't build on, sometimes we think it's good, we build on tofu block. <laughs> so you wonder, what's a tofu block? Tofu block is cement squares that you post your home on, thinking that that is a strong and a sure foundation, but it's not. If there, then an earthquake comes, that tofu block house will fall down. Why do we build on tofu block? Oftentimes we put it on the tofu block, because if we put it on that, it protects us from termites, from ground termites, and so we build on tofu block. But I'm telling you right now, not even tofu block can help when the waves come and the winds blow, because a flood will take that house down the street. Come on, somebody, right? So we have to build on the rock, and that's why we are built different, so we build different in Jesus' name. Come on, help me preach today so I can hurry up. All right, here it is. So we live in a time that is very precarious. We are living in a, in, in a time where the, the biggest crisis that we had since World War II, of course, was the Vietnam War. After the Vietnam War, and um, our veterans came back from that, and that was during my lifetime in the 70s and the 80s when I was a kid, um, them going through their own PTSD and being received back into society, and that was difficult. We know that. And then now what you have is, before that, you had the Cuban Missile Crisis, and we thought we were going to go to war with Russia during that time, and now what you have is you have this crisis that we're going through, and here in America, we're watching what's going on in Israel. Uh, we're, going, we're seeing what's happening with Iran. We're seeing what's happening with Ukraine and Russia. And now what we're worried or concerned about is what could happen in the Pacific with um, what's going on with China and possibly with um, Taiwan. So when we look at it, we, we realize that we're living in a time that we could be in a, in a bigger war. And that's why we have to be concerned because we are a military, organ I mean, a military um, bases all over these islands and we are grateful for our military and uh, sometimes some people are not, but I am. And when, when, when we need them, you better be grateful. Come on, somebody. And I'm grateful for the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, Marines, and the Coast Guard. And we're grateful for them. We're grateful for a lot, a lot of our brothers and sisters who are in the Air National Guard, the Army National Guard, people who grew up here who served there, and we're grateful for them. Let's give them a hand, everybody. That's awesome. So, this nation is reaping, the, reaping what, has been, what, what we have sown. When we have sown more seed of discord or we have more sown seed of culture and, and we're debating, like I said last week, we're debating pronouns and all that stuff, our enemy has gotten stronger in the meantime. And that's why we have to turn back to God because our nation at one time, I believe, might have been on rock, but now it's apparent that we are definitely on sand. And so we need to pray like never before. It reminds me in the book of Judges in a time, and the book of Judges is a period of time that comes out of the Joshua generation. The Moses generation, where the children of Israel had wandered for 40 years because of their disbelief uh, that they were going to inherit the promised land. They didn't believe it. When they went in, they were fearful. And when they sent in 12 reconnaissance mission spies, they go in, and two of them come back and said, easy money, we got this. God's going to give us the victory. Let's go in. But 10 of the guys that went in, they were fearful. They were scared. They said, I don't think we could do it. And then all of a sudden, the rumor spread throughout the whole community of Israel that just came out of the, the desert, just, just came out of the Red Sea experience, coming out of 400 years of slavery. And now all of a sudden, they're fearful, and it spreads through the whole community. So God says, you ain't going then. Your children will go, but you won't go. So for 40 years, you're just going to be in this desert, and you're going to walk around in circles. And that's what happened. So finally, the new generation is Joshua's generation. And Joshua was a military leader. He served under Moses, but not only did he serve under Moses, but while he, not only a military leader, but he knew how to seek the face of God. The Bible tells us that Joshua would linger longer in the tent of meeting with the Lord because he wanted to be in the presence of God. So Joshua was a warrior and he was a priest at the same time, so to speak. So he loved the presence of God. Now when Joshua comes of age in his leadership, now it's time to occupy and take the land. The inheritance after 40 years that this new generation gets to inherit. But they have to fight. And the Bible tells us that in Judges chapter 3, that God purposely left some of the nations in Israel to test them. To test the children of Israel because they had not been battle tested before. And so now they follow God and then we, we, we move into the period of Judges. And in the period of Judges after Joshua is a period where God would raise up a military leader. They would judge righteously, not unrighteously. And they would judge rightly. Come on somebody, right? They, they couldn't be bought. These judges could not be bought. And these judges were also military rulers. And the Holy Spirit would come upon them powerfully and they would lead the country back into victory against their enemies and then into revival and then you would have this peace period of prosperity then after that peace and prosperity period they would get comfortable 
and they go back and worship the other gods of all their neighboring nations instead of Yahweh himself. We find ourselves in Judges chapter 6, but in Judges chapter 5, verse 31, after this period of all these different judges, peace, oppression, starvation, um, people, people get killed, warfare is happening, and now they cry out to God. God sends them the deliverer in the form of a, a person, a judge, and then they have peace again. So it's this vicious cycle that they're going through, and the Bible tells us, in Judges chapter 5, verse 31, up on the screen here, and it says, and then there was peace in the land for 40 years. So 40 years of peace. How nice that is. 40 years. For half of your lifetime, there has been peace. If you're going to live till 80 or more, half of your lifetime you've experienced peace. But the other part of that other 40 years, you're not sure what kind of peace, if you even have peace. And in Judges chapter 6, verse 1, that peace only lasted for a, for a short time. It says the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So what did they do? Went back to the other gods. Made God upset. Molech, Ashtoreth, um, what's the other one? Uh, Baal, worshipped those gods instead. Sacrifice children in the fire. They did that, their own children. Uh, prostitution cults around the pole. And that's what they did. And they tried to sync it with their God worship at the same time. We worship Yahweh, but yeah, we let these other things come into our lives. It says the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. And so the Lord handed them over as punishment to the Midianites for seven years. Everybody say seven years. So for seven years, the Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in mountains, caves, bunkers, strongholds, and verse 3, and whenever the Israelites planted their crops, watch this, every time they planted a seed, every time a crop would sprout up, marauders from Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying their crops as far away as Gaza. We know about Gaza right now. The Gaza Strip is what, 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 what um, was the powder keg that made things go next level, right? Hamas came out of, the, okay, Hamas, the terrorist organization. It, it's not that the, all the people of Gaza are like this. It was the terrorist organization that broke through and took the Israel, Israelis and did what they did um, on October, I believe it was October 8th, as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat. Taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkey. So there's no meat. Sheep, goat, cattle. I'd eat the sheep. Come on, somebody. I eat sheep. Mulan. Uh, sheep, goat. I eat, eat, eat the billy goat, calding. Anybody eat the calding too? I eat the calding. Okay. Billy goat, calding. Uh, 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 cattle, 100%. 100% cattle. Donkey, I'm not so sure of. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if I want to eat donkey. But if I'm hungry, I will. But here it is. And so they take everything. There's no meat. And these enemy hordes, the enemy hordes, coming with their livestock and tents, were as thick as locusts. See the imagery? They arrived on droves of camels too numerous to count. And they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So all of your wheat, your barley, your grapes, the main harvest of Israel is gone because they took it all, ate it all. Okay? Now watch this. So the Israelites were reduced to starvation by the Midianites, and then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. Listen to this. Sometimes you let the enemy just stay in the land, and the enemy will take everything that you've got. The Bible says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus said, I come that you might have life and have it abundantly, right? So then they cried out to the Lord for help. So that's good, but it took about seven years for them to get to that place. Seven years. Hmm. Seven years. In the seventh year of everything going south, they finally turned back to the Lord. They cried out to the Lord. Then in verse 7, it says, When they cried out to the Lord for help because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. And he said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you I am the Lord your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live. But you have not listened to me. And the prophet drops the mic and he leaves the room. It's almost like I told you. We told you. We warned you. And then it says in verse 11, Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Ibiezer, the genealogy, and Gideon, 
son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a winepress to hide the grain from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Look at this. So God finds Gideon, son of Joash, threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. I love this passage of scripture. When you read it and you're younger, you begin to see it's like, oh, I mean, it's been portrayed and we buy into that, oh, Gideon was such a coward. Gideon's a coward. He's hiding his grain from the enemy. He's threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press. I get it. That's the way I used to look at it. Until I began to see it with different eyes. You know how you read a passage several times over and over and you think you got it? And then all of a sudden, God drops a different viewpoint. Maybe you're going through something in your life, and God says, look at it from this angle. Or maybe you're going through something in this part of your life, and God says, I want you to see it from this, this person's point of view. And all of a sudden, he gives you a revelation. He drops a rhema, a revelation of that word into your life, and you begin to see things differently than you've seen them before. Because why? Because of what you're going through. What you're going through. And when I begin to look at this, I see Gideon. Now, all of a sudden, he's doing what I would do. As a matter of fact, they're going through trials and tests right now. The Bible says in Judges chapter 3, verse 1, that the nations the Lord left in the land to test those Israelites who had not experienced wars of Canaan. So he, he did this to teach warfare to the generation. Now this generation has to learn how to fight. And that's why it's, it's good to have a little bit of adversity. It's good to be able to uh, allow your, your, your child to go through something. Not, you you, you want to you protect them, but you don't want to hover. You don't want to helicopter rescue kids all the time because you enable them. And when you enable them, they can take advantage of that. And then you didn't really help them. You actually hurt them. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. My, my mom never did that to us. <laughs> I mean, I was working since I was 11 years old, everybody. I was, I was mowing lawns in slippers, not shoes, slippers. <laughs> You know, and I remember going back to these days when oftentimes we would go through difficulties. And I remember my mom would tell me, man, I would get this one, one kid was one year younger than me, but picking on me. Oh, that can't happen. That should not happen. But he was bigger. He was taller. He was a little bit, yeah, he was bigger. And he was, you know, he was a little bit, he was a little bit, um, he, around, around the waist side, you know what I'm talking about? And we were like nine and ten year old boys. And I remember I would come back to my mom and I'd tell my mom, because my dad was on a business trip. I said, mom, Bobby keeps picking on me. So what are you going to do about it? Well, you guys keep telling me to be the bigger man. We said, like, well, you got to be the bigger man. Finally, after like five times coming back to my mom, and my dad was on a business trip, mom, he keeps picking on me. She goes, so she, this is what she does. She said, all right, I'm going to teach you how to fight. Okay. You know, she figured, she grew up sugar plantation, right? You know how scrap, right? Back in the day. And so she was like, well, you just hit him. You just hit him right in his stomach. It's the softest part, his stomach. I'm like, you sure? It's like, yeah. So I go to school the next day. Hey, Bobby, like scrap. Well, he's like, come on. So picking on me, he keeps on picking on me. Finally, we're out in the courtyard. You know, we buy the basketball courts and, you know, he's like juking and jiving. And all of a sudden, before I, I, I hit him in the stomach, and my, I swear, my, my hand went in just a little bit <laughs> like this. <laughs> it's like the Pillsbury Bowl, Doughboy. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing just came right back, and all Bobby did was hit me right there, chip my tooth. Oh, my gosh. We end up, and I get back. I said, Mom, you said hit him in the stomach. It didn't work. I got suspended and grounded by my parents because I got into a fight. <laughs> and it made no sense. I'm getting punished twice, punished by Bobby, Bobby's fist, and punished by my parents for getting into a fight. <laughs> Why did I tell you that? Resilience. Resilience. I do not advocate fighting. I, 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 don't, I don't want people to fight. Um, I, I, I'm moving right along because I'm going to get myself in trouble. Don't fight. Don't fight. It's not worth it. It's not worth, it's not worth fighting. Be the bigger man. Go to the office. Tell the principal, counselor. <laughs> Just do what you got to do to protect yourself after that. All right, here it is. So the Israelites, now they're going through this, and all of a sudden, he encounters Gideon. Gideon, I want you to wrap your mind around this. Gideon is, Gideon is threshing wheat in the bottom of wine press. There's seven years of oppression that's going on. Seven years of no food, eking out a living. Seven years of, uh, of intimidation. Seven years of, of, of stuff being stolen from you, taken from you by your enemy. And you can't even live. And people are so afraid that they've made places and caves for them to live. They've taken their cave and made it a livable situation. Not by choice, but because they had to. And you make the best of what you can with what you have when you're going through difficult times. And the people of Israel are going through this, and then all of a sudden there is one man 
Out of all of this, God picks one man in his, it's often God picks one person. God doesn't always pick a people. He always picks a person. Yeah. <clears throat> and the person that he picks is working it. Because what is he trying to do? He is threshing wheat. Why are you threshing wheat? Because he wants bread for his family. He's trying to get some bread. He's trying to feed his family. Because there's a process to getting bread. The first process is number one, you have to plant the seed. You have the, 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 the seed has to go into the ground and it has to be on good soil. It can't be on hard soil. It can't be on the rocky path like I talked about last week. It can't be on the thorny ground where it will choke it up. It can't be on the ground where the birds will come and snatch that seed away. And that word or that seed cannot get planted. That's why God wants our hearts and our lives to be good soil. Because if we are good soil, it will plant it and it will have a 30, 60, and 100 fold harvest in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. So you got to put that seed in the ground. And when you put that seed in the ground, you don't just ignore it and walk away. Oh, it should be good. Huh? Set it and forget it. That's what George Foreman said. No, no, no. Plant it. Water it. Fertilize it. Cultivate it. Watch over it. Protect it. And then eventually you will have a harvest. Second stage in the process is the harvesting stage. Harvesting, everybody loves harvest, right? Oh, we can't wait for the harvest. Especially if you're a pastor. Ooh, bring it in the harvest. But Jesus said the, the, the harvest is plentiful. Oh, the fields are white unto harvest, but the laborers are few. So pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers. I can tell you this, guys. We've had the greatest harvest that we've had in 22 to 23 years in the last two years. Incredible harvest. But can I tell you, harvesting is hard work. Harvesting is hard work, man. You got to like, we, I mean, the, the easy part is planting the seed and watering it and wait, waiting for it, wait for it, wait for it. How many months is it going to take? And then when it's time to harvest, hey, we need everybody's help. Hey, we need, hey, where are you guys going? We need help. And we need help. We could use your help. Join the dream team. Anyway, moving right along. So you harvest. So after you get the harvest, what do you do? You got to do the next stage in the level. And the next stage in the process is this, is thresh. Thresh. This is where you, you, um, this is where you get uh, the, 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 the wheat and you bring it onto the threshing floor. And normally the threshing floor is in an open air area. It's a platform. And you put all of your wheat on it and then you, you kind of, you, you're like, you're scratching it. You, you, you're really taking a board and you're using two beasts of burden or one beast of burden. And it's grinding that thing just a little bit to separate the chaff and to separate the kernel and to be able to, to loosen it up. And then after you go through the threshing, you go to the next stage and that would be the winnowing. And the winnowing is you take a pitchfork. And with the pitchfork, you throw it up in the air. You throw, throw the, the wheat and the kernel you're trying to separate the chaff. And you throw it up in the air. And you wave it like you just don't care. Somebody say, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you throw it up there. And all over Israel, people would be looking on the hills, and they'd see wheat flying in the air. Oh, my gosh, it's a great time. It's the harvest season. This is awesome. I can't wait to eat my bread. I'm going to have hot butter on my bread. I'm going to have Nutella and peanut. You know, I'm, I'm going to put some bananas and peanut butter on my bread. I'm already thinking about how I'm going to eat my bread. You know, everybody's, I can't wait to have a tuna sandwich. And everybody, like, you see all that stuff going up in the air. And you know what it is? It is the blessing of God, and it is the prosperity of God during the winnowing and then the fourth process, and the fifth process, excuse me, is finally when you get a millstone and you take the grain and now you grind it. You grind it on that millstone. And that millstone turns it into flour. And flour gives you pancakes. No, right. Flour gives you bread. And when you get this bread, you see the process that it takes. And Gideon is stuck on stage three of his life. He should be at stage five by now. He should be eating bread by now. He should be like eating, putting that butter all over it on that hot bread coming out of the oven. But right now, he is stuck on stage three. But not just stuck on stage three, everybody. He's doing stage three in a totally different environment. What is he doing? He is threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press. Wine press gives you very good. Comes from grapes. From grapes, you smash it. And then you have two monks that go in there. Oh, ah, ah, ah. How's your grapes? Ah, ah, ah. They're singing like the tune to the Little Mermaid. You know what I'm talking about? And they're squashing it all in there. They're having a good time. They're like, yeah, 
God, let's go, let's go, let's go, come on, let's go. Let's go. And, and they're squashing all that grapes. And then all of a sudden, the, the grapes turn into juice, and the juice goes into, and they fill it up into wine skins made out of goat skin or lamb skin. And they put it in there, and they tie it up, and then they put a little bit of yeast before they do that. And all of a sudden, the process begins to, fermentation begins to happen. And all of a sudden, now they've got wine. But Gideon is threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press. Not only is his process stuck, excuse me with a spit right there, stuck on stage three out of five, but he's doing stage three wherever he can do it. Because why? We got to eat. And we got to survive. If I got to take two part-time jobs, make it one full-time. If I got to work a full-time job and then start my side hustle on the side. If I got to stay up late, sacrifice my sleep, I don't have a day off, I need to get a day off because the Bible says have a Sabbath. No wonder I'm going crazy, I'm working too much, I'm working two jobs, I'm side hustling, I'm doing all these different things I cannot handle anymore. I'm about to have a breakdown. You know why? Because you're not honoring God with the Sabbath. Come on, everybody. Take a day off. Let, let yourself breathe. Let God do the work while you're off. Come on, somebody. Can I get an amen? But some of us are still stuck in stage three of life and never, never mind even the wine press. Never mind even the wine press. We're just stuck on stage three. We're stuck in stage three, not because we're bad. We're stuck on stage three because something's happened that's holding you up. You should be on four or five by now. You should be progressing to four or five and eating that bread. But you're not. You're stuck on three. Why? Because sometimes God's got you there to learn to ideate, to use your mentality, to, to change the way you think. Sometimes, what, you, uh, you, you know, how you doing? Oh, I'm good, Pastor. How's everything going? Oh, I'm just threshing. It's a threshing season right now, Pastor. I like to hear that. You know what that tells me? I like to hear that. It tells me that you are fighting. It tells me that you have not given up. It tells me that you're doing whatever it takes to find out what, what stage four and stage five looks like in your life. And I'm telling you right now, I'm getting ahead of my points. I haven't given you points, but there's all kinds of points without giving you the points. And I'm telling you right now, man, man I'm telling you right now, there's going to be times in your life that you're thinking, man, I'm going through this, I'm doing that. And I can tell you this, what, what I believe, not just the favor of God, it was the favor of God. God is sovereign in his choices. Why did he pick Michael Kai from the big island from Horaka? I don't know. It's sovereign. But I can tell you that I probably was obedient more than likely, and I can tell you that God can hear the noise you are making while you're scratching. And God can see the efforts of what you're going through to make it happen. And I believe Gideon caught God's attention. It was by accident. It wasn't on purpose. But God is watching. God is seeing. God can hear you. He can see it. He can hear it. If you're scratching, if you're working hard, and the worst thing about it is, or the most interesting part about it is, is he is threshing Wheat, he wants bread where you make wine. Ooh, new revelation coming to me right now. It's going to happen. I'm just like, it's just, it's just the beginning. Bread and wine. God has this guy making bread where you supposed to make wine. And before I get ahead of myself and make stuff up, I'm telling you right here <laughs> that what God is doing in a season of life right now is he is making bread in places you never expected the bread to come from in Jesus' name. You need a point. I can tell you need a point. I can tell you need a point. Some of you are going to have a struggle with this if I don't give you a point. And here it is. The Lord says to Gideon, he says, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Can you just receive it? That's the title of my sermon. Can you just receive it? Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Mighty hero, the angel of the Lord. You know who that is? That's Yahweh. That's that, or, or a pre-incarnate version of Christ. Shows up while you threshing and you work in it. And he sits there or he stands there and says, mighty hero. The Lord is with you. Can you just receive it? Have you ever given anybody a compliment before? That they can't, they can't take the compliment? They had a hard time? They had a hard time receiving it? They either got a theological reason why they're not worthy of receiving that compliment, or uh, maybe they've got an inferiority complex going on at that moment, or they're practicing false humility. Where, oh, no, 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 no. Or oh, whatever it is, but they're having a hard time receiving what God wants to say to you. 
And sometimes when we go through these seasons of our life, could you just receive it? Can you just receive that you are a mighty woman of God? Can you just receive that you are more than a conqueror through Christ? Can you just receive it that you are the head and not the tail? Can you receive it that you are above and not beneath? Can, can I tell you that you are the favorite of God and you are building different because God's got different for you in Jesus' name? And the worship team can come up. Number one, you got to see yourself as God sees you. You got to see yourself as God sees you. Not the way that the world sees you, not the way that you even sometimes when you see you. Sometimes we look in the mirror and we go like, man, I wish I was better. I wish I was handsomer. I wish I was prettier. I wish I was more skilled. I wish I was like him. I wish I was like her. I wish I, I, I and, and sometimes we look at that mirror and our self-talk back to our mirror is not positive. Why? Because we are looking at the way the world sees us, not even the way that we see us. Sometimes our parents are speaking life into us, but the opinions of your friends or whatever is being said online or TikTok or whatever is more important to you than it is Right? And I'm telling you, what God, the way that God sees you is better than the way you see yourself every single time. Amen. I'm not talking about the guy that looks, or the girl that looks and thinks they're, they're, they're more than that. Right? <laughs> Have some humility. You know what I'm talking about? But that's probably not most of our problem. Most of our problem is we don't see ourselves that way. And God bring somebody into our life and when he brings somebody into your life and they tell you they tell you this is well, this is what who I think you are this is what I believe you are Benny Perez is that guy for me pastor Benny Perez from the church LV church Las Vegas Las Vegas got great churches I hear they got good casinos but they got great churches <laughs> come on we're sin abounds grace abounds even more somebody great churches in Las Vegas <clears throat> and he's he's the kind of guy that would speak life into me. He can tell me, Mike, you are this, man. I'm telling you right now, you don't see it for yourself. I don't know how many times I gotta tell you, but Mike, I see this in you, you don't see it in yourself. Thanks, Pastor Benny, thanks, Pastor Benny, appreciate that. My dad was the same way. Before my dad died, my dad would tell me stuff, man, make, make, make a 40-year-old man cry, because of what my dad would tell me. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Now I'm 50, and I wish I'm 50-something, I'm leaving right there. I miss, <laughs> I miss his voice. Today's my mom's birthday. Mom's in Phoenix. Happy birthday, mom. Love you. The Israelites struggled with the way that they saw themselves. The Israelites struggled. When the Numbers chapter 13, when the 12 spies go in, right? I told you about the spies. And they come out. You know what they said? This is what they said in verse 33. They said, we even saw giants there. The descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers and that's what they thought too. How do you know? You talk to them? No. We just figured that's what they thought. So you never talk to the, you never talk to the, to the giants? No. But we thought we looked like grasshoppers in their eyes. See how we can get distorted? And God says to Gideon, you are a mighty man of God. While, while Gideon is trying to protect his family's food source. Now I've been trying to get you to protect your food source for the last three years. Can you testify that I've been talking about food? Okay, right? You know, that I've been saying for the last three years, you need non-perishables that's going to last for at least six months for your family in case the supply chain breaks down here in Hawaii, in case the tsunami, which will damage all of our ports. If something comes from South America or something comes from Alaska or something comes from any other place, it could come from Asia, that if a natural disaster takes out our shipping lanes and our ports or a communication system if a man-made disaster begins to happen where we lose all electricity and everything spoils in your freezer and all of that and you're not off the grid you're still on the grid if whatever it is I've been saying it for the last three years that you got to protect yourself and make sure that you have enough food for the next six months to every person and then and, and, and guess what um, guess what and if you did and you didn't need it, but you always might need it, and you don't want it to go spoil or whatever it is, you replenish your stock, but don't overeat your stock. Oh, we never lost store two years already. Oh, two years, and all of a sudden, oh, God. Spam, come on somebody, spam. Spam, hey, don't hate it, don't hate on it. Don't eat too much though. Don't hate on it. Spam will last a long time. Even when you open that can, I think the thing still lasts two more weeks with the jelly around it. 
I just made that up. Don't do that. <laughs> oh, that jelly still protect them out. Yeah, just like one baby. All good, bro. Slice them. Toast the oven, fry them, whatever. Last point. But Gideon said in verse 15, but Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh. There's 12 tribes. Let's go through the funnel. My clan is the weakest. My family is part of a clan. And out of the clan is my family, family, clan, tribe. And I'm the least of the least. He might be exaggerating his circumstance, but he got a little bit of point there. Number one, they are under oppression for seven years. Got to do something to you. When someone says, I believe in you, like, I don't believe in myself right now. Thank you for believing in me, but I don't believe in Can you just receive it? Can you just receive it by faith? You're not there yet, but one day you will be there. Or you might be there right now and just receive it. You are there. You've already, you're there. And so now what happens, he says, I am in the tribe of Manasseh. You know the tribe of Manasseh was a half tribe because the other half was Ephraim. And they was given to Joseph's portion, which was one of the 12 sons of Jacob. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 12 sons. And Joseph was one of the 12 sons. He's the one that saved everybody by food preservation, seven years. Come on, everybody. And then the half tribe of Manasseh and the half tribe of Ephraim, but only one tribe was called the half tribe. I don't know why. I don't know why. When they're calling for people to report for duty. Reporting for duty, sir. The tribe of Judah, the lions. Next, the tribe of Benjamin, the favored. We're here. We were reporting, sir. Next, the half tribe of Manasseh. Wait, was the full tribe? We're just a half tribe. Sorry, just a half tribe. The half tribe. The half tribe of Manasseh. I'm the least of everybody. He's got this full-on inferiority thing going on. And God says, number one, I see you differently. I want you to see yourself as God sees you, everybody. And number two, you got to start, com stop complaining and start receiving. Look at what he says in verse 13. Sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are the miracles that our ancestors told us all about? Didn't they say, the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. And then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have and rescue Midian or rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. Go with the strength that you have. I am sending you. Go with the strength that you have. He is sending you. Go with the strength you have. God is sending you. Man, you are winnowing. You are threshing. You are making sound. You don't want the enemy to see your cloud of harvest. You don't want anybody to see what's going on. That you have picked a wine press in order to thresh wheat because you can't go up on that hill. You get up on the hill, they're going to kill you. So you go over here. You know what you're doing? When you do stuff like that, you are creating new opportunities. You are ideating for the business people. You are looking at solutions that nobody would look at. You're doing whatever it takes. This is not just survival mode. This is innovation mode in the name of Jesus. Come on. Come on, somebody say amen. And the last two points I'm going to give you on Deep Dive Wednesday. I'm only supposed to do two this morning. I have a four-point sermon, but I'm going to give you the two on Deep Dive Wednesday. We're running out of time. I want to pray for us right now here today. Don't leave. Don't get up early. Don't like, oh, we got to go. No. Stay right now. If that's you today that you feel like, man, I've been scratching I've been threshing and you're working really, really hard and you're looking to stage four but you're stuck on stage three. You can't even get to stage five right now but you know you heard from God or you know that this is the right thing to do. This is your purpose in life. This is, you, you got to provide, put, put bread on that table, bring the bread in, whatever it is and you're on stage, you feel like you're in stage three. You're not quite there yet. You're not on stage four. And you want to move, you man, you've seen the Lord to move, that you've been making noise, you've been making some good noise, some good noise, not complaining noises, but good noise. God can see you, He sees you, that's you, raise your hand right now, I want to pray for you right now, raise your hand right there, come on, put your hand up, I'm not going to count to three, just put your hand up, I'm making noise, I'm scratching, I'm doing whatever it takes. I'm doing whatever it takes to bring in some bread for the family. I'm doing whatever it takes to make it work. Come on. Awesome. Awesome. I want you to receive this. Father, we pray right now in the name of Jesus for every hand that is going up. 
God, we on stage three right now. Some people just on stage one, but some people on stage five. But right now, this is for the stage three. We are in the threshing season. We are threshing. We are scratching. We are making it work, God. God, we pray, Lord God, that, you, that you, there would be breakthrough. We pray, Lord God, that we would get up on a hill and we would throw it up in the air and the chaff would blow all away the rubbish. There, all the rubbish of our life would be gone, Lord God, and the kernels would fall to the ground. The grain would fall to the ground. Father, we pray right now for a harvest of 30, 60, 100 fold over people who are struggling either with their business right now or wrestling with some finances or they are stuck in a season of non-promotion. The doldrums, this is where they are. Uh, the wind has stopped blowing right now. And God, I'm saying right now, I'm seeing a picture that some people right now, you are trying to manufacture wind. You are trying to manufacture wind in your sails. And God says, just open the sail and keep on rowing. I will bring the wind. Just open the sail, but keep on rowing and I will bring the wind. And that's the picture that I just saw for somebody or maybe all of you right now in the name of Jesus. Go ahead and put your hand down right now. Right now, I want to pray for people who need healing. You've got a diagnosis, a prognosis, or you found something, you feel something, you're afraid to go in, you're afraid to get it examined, or you're procrastinating, you say, ah, I'll check them later, I'll check it later, I'm too busy, it's going to be too long to get an appointment, and this and that and that, and you've procrastinated and you put it off. But I'm telling you right now, don't put it off, go get it checked. But I want to know right now, whatever you found, whatever you've heard, whatever you've, they've written to you, whatever phone call you got right now in the name of Jesus, we're going to pray for healing. Go ahead and raise your hand if that's you. Go ahead and raise your hand if that is you right here in this room, that you need healing right now over your body. And if you want healing over your mind and your emotions right now, put your hand up too. Put your hand up too if that's you. Come on. Right now there's power. There's, there, I, I feel the presence of God to, to heal. Father, we pray right now in the name of Jesus that the healing power of the Holy Spirit and the great physician Jesus Christ and by his stripes that we are healed that healing power would come now come now by the authority that you gave us that the healing power would come now in the name of Jesus mm. say I receive it can you just receive it say I receive it amen one more prayer. This is the most important prayer I pray every weekend. There's, they're all important, but this one. If you've never given your life to Jesus, if you want to be on the right side, you want to be on the, the side that says, I'm saved, sanctified, set apart for God. If you want the forgiveness of all of your sins, a guilty conscience gone, that you want a clean slate, a fresh beginning, a new start, that you want the Spirit of God in you, you realize that the world is getting eviler, more evil than ever before, and you want to know, man, you want, to, you want the assurance that when you die, you're going to be with Him, but you, you need more than just heaven right now. You need heaven and you need His help. You need His presence on this earth earth right now you want him to walk with you protect you every step of the way your marriage your family yourself your singleness whatever it is whoever you are at the count of three I want you to raise your hand for salvation John chapter 3 verse 3 says you must be born again that's you and you're not born again I want you to raise your hand at the count of three join me join me in that prayer the prayer that I said when I was 21 get ready to pray here we go one at the count of three he will never let you down he will never let you down get ready one two here it comes three put your hand up if that's you put your hand, hand up if that's you that's mike that's me that's me that's me that's me that's me i want salvation i want jesus we got one right there amen brother amen right on awesome good choice good good decision two three right here god bless you four right there five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve amen 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 coming in the middle i'm coming in the middle i'm right in the middle if you're in the middle lift your hand higher so i can see it 13 if you're in the middle lift your hand higher if you are on the right side which is my left i'm coming here right now right side left you raise your hand okay one two three four that's 13 13 14 15 16 17 amen 18 19 20 21 22 right here 22 right here 23 24 all right awesome 24 anybody else 25 right here 26 27 god bless you 28 right there Amen. He sees that hand. God sees every single hand. 28 right there. I believe I've counted 28 people that have raised their hands. 29 right there on the camp. Come on. All right, everybody, put your hands down. Put your hands down. Come on. Can we thank the Lord before we pray? Everybody, repeat after me. Repeat after me, especially the 29 people that raised their hands and people online right now. Say, Jesus, today I surrender and give you my life. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean as white as snow. 
by the blood of Jesus Christ and the blood of the Lamb that washes me as white as snow, as if I've never sinned before. Thank you for dying on the cross, shedding your blood. I'm born again. The old is past. The new has begun. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus, created to serve you and to bring you glory with the life you gave me. Teach me all of your ways. When I read the Bible, may it come alive. May you speak to me and protect the seed that has been planted on good soil for 30, 60, 100 harvest in my life and in my family. I bless you today. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen. Come on, can we thank the Lord?